Hello, Sunday School. It's good to be with you again. We've got a great Sunday School uh, lesson coming out of the book of Matthew. We're going to read Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. We'll skip down and read verses 16 through 17. Then we'll flip over to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And our topic for today is fulfilling one's calling. And our unifying topic is call through heritage. So we'll pray and we'll get started with our lesson today. Father God, we just thank you for another week you've seen us safely through. Father, we just lift you up with glory, honor, and praise for you are worthy of our praise. Father, we thank you for this lesson that we're going to study today. I pray that you open up our hearts and our minds, Father, to receive your word. Give us the wisdom, Father, to be obedient to the word. And most of all, Father, we just thank you for Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. As I said, we're coming out of the book of Matthew to begin with. And let me tell you a little something about Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. They called him publicans. And his job, and he was a Jew, and his job was to collect taxes from the Jews and turn the money over to the government. Now, there were a lot of dishonest tax collectors. I don't know if Matthew was one of them or not, but a lot of them would collect more than they should, and they would turn over to the government just what the government required, and then they would keep the rest themselves. And the Jews did not like them. First of all, they were their own people that was collecting money from them. And most people don't like tax collectors, uh, especially if they're dishonest as these were. We, have, we don't particularly like tax collectors today. We don't call them tax collectors. We call them the IRS, and they're not our favorite people either. So Matthew, uh, profession as tax collector, Jesus called him from that profession and he called them into the profession of fisher of men. Now, Matthew writes his synoptic gospel, and in right out of the gate, his whole essence is to get them to see that through prophets and everything that had been done, Jesus is the Messiah. He doesn't want them to have any misunderstanding of who Jesus was and that he was the true Messiah. So in our lesson today, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 1, and I'll read the first six verses for you. Then we'll discuss those and move on from there. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerai, whose mother was Tamar, Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Amenadab, Amenadab, the father of Najon, Najon, the father of Solomon, Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Raham, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Je Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Okay, let's just discuss these first uh, six verses. And it starts off with, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. And a lot of times people like to dig into their heritage, their genealogy or their lineage, just to see who's who, who they descended from. Sometimes it's a fun experience to do that. Sometimes you, you turn over a rock and under that rock is something you really wasn't expecting or you don't want really anybody else to know about it, that that happened in your family. But Matthew is about to turn over all the rocks <laughs> that's in Jesus' uh, heritage. And he starts off by telling us that he's talking about Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now he called these two distinctive men by name because he wants them to understand everybody knows king david all the jews love king david they all knew who abraham was abraham was the father of the of many nations which god had told him you're going to be the father of many nations and god called abraham to be 
the patriarch of his people, of the people that God was going to put under his wings, he called Abraham to be that leader. And our verse says, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Now we know Isaac was not Abraham's first child. Abraham's first son was, was uh, conceived by his handmaiden, but that was not what God had intended. God had told him he would have a son with Sarah. And Isaac became that son with Sarah. Then Isaac became the father of Jacob. Now, we know Jacob had a twin brother, Esau. They were, uh, Jacob stole his brothers, Esau's birthright. And we do know that uh, Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, they showed favoritism between these two sons. Then it says Jacob became the father of Judah and his brothers. Jacob became the father of the 12 tribes of Israel because he had 12 sons. Judah was not the first son and Judah was not the baby son, but he was one of uh, Judah's son. Then it says Judah became the father of Perez and Zariah, whose mother was Tamar. Now they have put up through a woman in the mix. Now Judah had three sons. He actually had three, two sons that he gave to Tamar. She married his first son and she, and that son died. So then he told his next son that he was to marry Tamar so that his brother's uh, lineage would go on. And th this son also died. So that was Tamar with no husband. So Judah told her she could have the another son that he had, but that son was not grown yet. So he told her when he got of age, she could have that son as her, as her husband, but that didn't happen. He did not give her that son as a husband when he became of age. So she tricked Judah into sleeping with her and gave him a set of twins, which was Perez and Zara. So there was a little uh, I guess things going on there when she tr had to trick her father-in-law into fathering uh, some children for her. Then uh, Hezron, he became the father of Ram. Ram became the father of Amenadab. Amenadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Solomon. Solomon, the father of Boaz. Now we get to another familiar name that we recognize, which is Boaz. And it says, whose mother was Rahab. Again, bringing out some women. Now, we all know who Rahab was. She was, they called her a harlot. She was the one that when the uh, when they went in to uh, spy for Jericho, she took the spies that they sent in and she hid them on the roof so that they would not be found. And God spared her life and she uh, became uh, a follower of God and ended up marrying into the family. Then it says... Uh, Bo uh, Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Now, we know Obed and Ruth got married. O Ruth was a Moabite, another woman that was a Moabite, and she ended up marrying Boaz, and they had Obed. And it says Obed became the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. Then it says, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. I don't know why they didn't call her by name, but we all know it's, uh, they're talking about Bathsheba. But what happened here was that she was the wife of Uriah, and David spied her from the roof one day and decided he wanted her for himself, even though he knew she was already married. And he came up with a scheme to get rid of of her husband. Now Solomon was not the first child between him and Bathsheba. The first child that he had uh, with Bathsheba while she was still married to Uriah died. And Solomon became the second child uh, to David after him and Bathsheba got married. And, and that just gives us a little background on the lineage of Jesus in your Bible from, um, verses from this verse on down you'll have some more lineage of of jesus and it says in verse 16 and jacob became the father of joseph 
the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Those 14 uh, different generations is where you hear a lot of ministers talk about Jesus came down through 40 and two generations. These are the 40 and two generations they're talking about. We didn't go through all the names here, but they are in your Bible, so you, you would be able to read and find those. But Matthew comes right out of the gate giving Je Jesus lineage, and he doesn't try to whitewash Jesus' lineage. He tells it as it is. And as you can see from some of the, the women that I gave you a little background on some of the women, we know that his uh, lineage was not squeaky clean, just like our lineage is not squeaky clean. There are some dysfunctions in everybody's family, and Jesus' family was no different. Uh, there was uh, some of everything going on. You had good parents that had bad children. You had bad parents that had good children. There were people of power. There were people with great courage. That He had rulers in his uh, lineage. He also had dishonesty going on. He had sibling rivalry going on. There was also murder and murder plots, incest, just everything, seduction going on within Jesus' lineage. And I promise you, if we went back far enough in ours, we found a lot of stuff to have us with our mouth hung open, wondering, I can't believe that happened. I can't believe my, you know, that, that happened in my family, in my bloodline. But there is a lot of dysfunction that goes in in all of our bloodline. And Jesus was no different. In order to get him here through them 42 generations, God used some people that you probably would not have expected to be in the uh, bloodline of Jesus. Now, when you get to verses uh, 16, when he calls jo uh, talks about Joseph and Mary, Joseph was not Jesus' biological father, he was, but he was his legal father. And to the Jews, the legality was what meant a lot to them. If you were legally someone's heir or, or you also had rights and privileges to everything that they own once you were their legal guardian, that's just like if we go out and you'd adopt a child today. That child has all rights and privilege of any other child that you may have had, even if you have a, a child born to you. Once you adopt a child, they have the same rights and privileges as the one that you had yourselves. So even though Joseph was not biologically Jesus' father, he was the legal father, and therefore the heritage that Joseph came down through belonged to Jesus as well. Then it says these 14 generations that came between Abraham and David, Abraham being the, the father that was called to start this nation and then you have David who became the first real earthly king that acted like a king and did those things that were pleasing in God's sight. And then you get them backsliding and getting put in exile to Babylon where they had to stay until they were freed again. And then after that became Jesus Christ came on the scene, the Messiah. So you have a lot of dysfunction going on in Jesus' heritage. And like I told you, I dare to say we won't have a lot going on in ours. But you will find, even though all these things went on in Jesus' heritage, God was still able to do what he intended to do, which was to bring the Messiah to reign here on earth, to bring the Messiah to bring salvation to his people because no one else could do it but Jesus. And God works that same way with us. He does not care what's in your background. If God needs to use you, he will use you. He does not care. It doesn't matter who's in the closet, what skeletons you have in the closet, what awful thing you got going to crawl out on a rock. He don't care if you got... Uh, a great granddaddy that was a drunk. He don't care if you have 
three or four uh, ancestors that ended up in prison. Whatever God has for you, it is for you. And he knows your background. You don't have to tell him your lineage. You don't have to pretend, oh, you came from a very respectable family and you'll have a long line of this, that, and the other. It does not matter. God can use anybody, anywhere, at any time. So this is one of the things that Matthew would bring it out here. Now let's go over to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and it reads, In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through him also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. Now, now Matthew's giving us Jesus' genealogy. Now we go over here and see uh, what God has to say to his people about Jesus' purpose. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. He starts off in Hebrews by saying, God speaks to his people. God communicates to his people. He has different ways of doing it, but he always communicates to his people. He says he's done it through the prophets many times and in various ways. We know uh, the prophets spoke for God. God would tell them what he wanted the people to know or what he wanted the people to do. And they, in turn, would relay that information to the people. God also used other ways to speak. He spoke to Moses from a burning bush. He uh, spoke to uh, Joseph through dreams. He spoke to different people through visions. We read in Old Testament where a lot of them had visions that God would present in front of them so that they would get an understanding of what he wanted and how he wanted things done. So, and then it says, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God sent his son down through these 40 and two generations to arrive here at the right time, at the exact time that he arrived here because God, Jesus came with purpose. God gave him a purpose when he sent him here. And just like Jesus has a purpose, regardless of this lineage he had to come through to get here, we have purpose. God has given each of us purpose. Some have already done your purpose. Some purpose are yet to come. God doesn't care what's in our past. He's concerned about our future. And we should be too. So he tells us, in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. God put Jesus in charge. Jesus is in charge of everything. Everything ever created, God has put under Jesus' authority, and he has put him over everything in the universe. It says the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Jesus is God. And that's what he kept trying to tell him the whole time he was here on earth. The Father and I are one. If you see me, you have seen the Father. There be no difference in us. It says he is the radiance of God's glory. And when you think of radiance, you just think of, I do, of just brightness coming out. And that's what Jesus is. He is the radiance of God's glory 
and he is the exact rep representation. You know how sometimes you'll tell truth, oh, you look just like your dad, or oh, you're the spitting image of your mother. And most of the time, those uh, uh, features don't last long. Eventually, down the line, you start to change. They say, oh, you look, you look like your mom. Now you look like your dad. But Jesus is an exact representation of God's being. Him and God are one. He says, sustaining all things by his powerful word. We know if we go back to the beginning of Genesis, Jesus was there when they spoke. They didn't create nothing. They spoke things into existence. He was there when God created man in, in their image. Jesus was there. And then it says, after he had provided purification for sin, after Jesus had made his sacrifice to save mankind, he now sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And the right hand represents honor, it represents authority, and it represents power. He says, Jesus sat down. Once his job down here was done, he sits next to the Father and he has all those authority. He has all power. Jesus has all that. He sat down, and he's still sitting there today. That's why Jesus tells us, whatever you need, ask me, for I have all power. God has given me all power over creation. That means everything you can see, as far as you can see, Jesus is in charge of it. So he he, he often tells us to ask because we have not because we ask not. And when we ask, we got to ask believing. And if you don't, you just ask in a miss and you're not getting it. He says, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited. It is superior to those. Now, Jesus and the angels, he, here they're trying to explain to us, yes, yeah, some people put their trust and things like that in angels, but he's saying Jesus is superior to, to angels. They said even his name is superior to the angels as, because the angels were a created being. They were created. Jesus exists just like the Father exists. And uh, so they said he is superior to them. And then verse 5 said, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father? Or again, he says, I will be his father, and he will be my son. God said none of that to any of the angels, because Jesus is the only one that is the son of the living God. And I like what we read today. If I go back to the title that says, Fulfilling One's Calling. Jesus had a calling, and he fulfilled that calling. Even coming through all that lineage and all that baggage he carried in his bloodline, he was still able to do what God had purposed him to do. And even with all the baggage we carry, we will still be able to do what God has purposed us to do. God knows what we need and how best to give us that information. And he gave us what he needs on a need-to-know basis. That's why when God communicates with us, just like he said that he communicated with the prophets differently, he communicates with us differently. Some people have different learning styles. I might react to lecturing. Somebody else may react. They have to have interactive uh, learning. And then you have uh, other people that are visual learners. So God knows what it takes for each of us. That's why he talked to Moses from that burning bush. He knew what would get Moses' attention. And he knows the same about us. So he speaks to us in different ways. But whatever he has purposed us to be will be done. Our text also brings out the fact that Jesus was fully man, but also 
fully God. He was like no other man ever that ever lived. And we also shouldn't question whether we're worthy to do what God calls us to do just because of our background, just because what in our bloodline or what's in our family tree. God can use you wherever you are. All he requires you to do is to be obedient, to do what he says. Sometimes even what God calls us to do seems to be an impossible task. He's not going to give you anything you can't do without him. So whatever he's called us to do, we need to do it because we never know what calling we're fulfilling that God has given us. Jesus fulfilled his calling, and now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. One day, we will fulfill our calling, and we too will get to, to be in heaven. I ain't saying we're going to be on the right side, but we're going to be, be there gathered around the throne where Jesus and God is sitting. That's all I, I'm shooting for, is to, is to be where they are. So I, I hope you enjoy this lesson talking about Jesus' genealogy and kind of look back over your own genealogy and, and understand it doesn't matter what's there. God's got your future. I thank you for tuning in this morning and let me give you your scripture for next week. Next week, we're going to come out of Matthew still again. We're going to be in Matthew picking up <coughs> verses 18 through verses 25. So if you read that, then you'll be in great shape for next week. Let me give you the topic for next week, if I can get this page to turn. And it's uh, called, Call to Participate in a Promise. And the unifying topic is Call Before Birth. I thank you, and let us pray, and we will see you again next Sunday. Father God, we thank you for this lesson that talked about the genealogy of Jesus, how you used him, Father, how he fulfilled the promise that you had handed down from generation to generation. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifice he, he made. Father, we open up our hearts and our minds, Father, to be used by you to do what you called us to be, Father, that we forget what's behind us and push toward their high calling. Father, we thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.